Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first Rewind event of the winter quarter. Uh, my name is Shana Hammerman. I'm the Associate Director of Jewish Studies uh, at the Taube Center for Jewish Studies at Stanford. I want to introduce you to several important people. Uh, we have Eitan Kensky, who is the Reinhardt Family Curator, right? Um, yeah. Deca at Stanford Libraries, uh, Gabriella Safran, who's a professor of Slavic language and literature, and Paloma Eisenberg, who is our undergraduate director of the Rumand film series. Um, and of course, last but not at all least, we have Susan Seidelman, who we're so uh, happy to welcome here today with us, um, who will talk to us about her experiences as a Jewish wom woman filmmaker, because this year we are celebrating um, and sort of exploring the films of Jewish American women. Uh, and we're going to talk today about Desperately Seeking Susan. You can see the jacket behind me, um, among other films um, and, and television uh, that Susan has directed. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I also want to announce that this is a series. So while you might have come because you're really excited about Susan Seidelman's films, um, we hope that you'll come again and pay attention to our mailings about this. On February 25th, we have the film critic and scholar Mark Harris coming to discuss with us and honor um, the filmmaking career of Joan Micklin Silver, who recently passed away. Um, she's most famous for the films Hester Street and Crossing Delancey, uh, and we're excited to, to to learn more about her life. On March 11th, Paloma will be hosting an undergraduate uh, watch party of the film Yentl, starring Barbara Streisand. So um, if you are an undergrad or know an undergrad, um, there are there is financial incentive to join that watch party. So hit me up. Um, and then on March 16th, we are co-sponsoring an event with Moment Magazine, um, all of this sort of TBD uh, to discuss Yentl alongside um, A Tale of Love and Darkness. Tale of Love and Darkness, thank you. Uh, the, the film based on Amos Oz's uh, novel. So thank you again for coming to Rewind and we hope you have a wonderful discussion. I'm going to disappear myself and uh, let uh, Eitan, Gabriella and Paloma start the show. Susan, it's really great to have you here. I'm so excited to talk with you. Um, a couple of nights ago, I was watching a documentary film that you made in the early 1990s, Confessions of a Suburban Girl. And you know, you appear on camera in the film, and you go and you talk to some of your former classmates. And you said something at the beginning that kind of resonated with me, because I think if you flip around what you said, it could function as a thesis statement for your work. So what you said was, if the suburbs are too protective, they're a world without drama, without adventure, where everything was the same. So when did you realize that you wanted to make movies about losing protections, finding drama, going on adventures, and embracing all of the difference that's out there? Well, first let me say I'm really happy to be with you guys. So thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I just to give you a little background, you know, I grew up in a suburb outside of Philadelphia. It was a predominantly Jewish suburb, very middle class, very um, homogenous in the sense that it was one of those developments that were built in the 1950s or actually the late 50s early 60s where you got to kind of pick the style house you wanted there was the colonial the ranch and the split level we had the colonial and you know it, it felt very safe and and protected but it also felt really homogenous and as somebody who from an early age kind of had I wouldn't say artistic aspirations, but just felt slightly different. Like I, I always love the arts. I, I love fashion as a way of being artistic um, uh, as well as drawing and painting. I was like in the art tract in high school, but uh, in many other ways, I was a typical suburban middle-class Jewish girl, but still there was something about this thing inside of me that felt like there's a bigger world out there, there's more diversity out there, there's other things I could be, other experiences I could be having. And so from an early age, I kind of felt this, I had this feeling that because the biggest city to, to where I was growing up, you know, with the shining lights and everything was New York. And the only thing I knew about New York, quite frankly, were, were the movies that I had seen at the suburban, 
cinema, you know, Breakfast at Tiffany's or had watched on TV, that girl with Marlo Thomas, you know, that was my impression of, of, of life in the big city. But yet there was a theme that I wasn't aware of at that time, but that permeate through those movies, which is this outsider girl coming to the big city to, to reinvent themselves in some way, to become the person that they kind of wanted to be inside, but didn't have the opportunity to be in the environment that they were living in. So uh, in some ways that was something that has been consistent in many of my films over the past 30 years, but really came from uh, who I was growing up in suburban Philadelphia. And since you know, since you mentioned being on this fashion track, maybe actually this is a time to ask you about this. Um, you know, you you have such an intricate sense of of clothes and the makeup and the music and the dance, and you use this to really create this kind of fully realized world. You know, for your characters, um, all the production design elements are just so outstanding. And basically, if you pick up a Susan Seidelman film, you know you're watching it because everything is so precise and meticulous. Um, and so. What I wanted to know was, what do you think of style as a way of placing yourself in the worlds of its characters? Did you know that this was always going to be an important part of your filmmaking? Well, I should um, backtrack a little bit. When I was, you know, after I graduated high school, you know, having this, you know, uh, artistic uh, impulse, um, one of the ways I, I, I manifested that was in terms of clothes and, and fashion. And I thought I wanted to be a fashion designer. So originally I went to um, a school called uh, Drexel University. It was called Drexel Institute of Technology at the time because they had a fashion program. And uh, it, was, it was a kind of an extension of HOMAC. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you got to, uh, you know, you, the first year you got to, do, you know, the, you took design courses, but after that, you know, the second year you were at a sewing machine and I kind of found myself as a sophomore feeling like, oh, you know, here I am sewing and um, this isn't exactly how I wanted to spend my life. So kind of what happened was, so fashion was always sort of a part of my life as a way to make it a statement about who you were. That's how as a high school kid, I could design sort of these, wacky outfits or not even wacky just outfits that I thought expressed me <laughs> or my friends in some way and 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 uh um but so I found myself behind a sewing machine and realized that I was not at all happy and so I started taking um film appreciation classes I had never seen foreign films growing up in in high school and I had a, a really interesting teacher who introduced me to French new wave cinema to Ingmar Bergman to uh you know all kinds of films I had never seen before including American classics I had never seen um and suddenly it was like my you know it was like a world opened up I realized that there was all this these great stories out there that I, you know, that could be told. And I also realized that film incorporated all the things that I liked. It was a visual medium. It, it, it was about storytelling. It was about design. It was about music. It had all the other art forms rolled into one. And um, so at that point, I still had not made a film, but I knew I wanted to watch them. And if I could get a job, which no one was offering me as a, film, someone who, I didn't even want to write about them. I just wanted to watch them. If I could have gotten paid to watch movies, that would have been at that time, the ideal job. But- um, Well, Aidan Quinn works as a projectionist. Did you think about doing that? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'd rather just watch them and get paid. <laughs> but um, what, what I did, because I really didn't know about film school either. This was in 19, you know, the early mid 70s and film schools were not that popular back then. Uh, so I, on a whim, applied to NYU Film School, not, well, thinking really it would get me out of Philadelphia and, and it would finally get me to New York, but also thinking that uh, I never really thought I'm going to be a director. I just thought I'll, I'll see what film school is about. And for some reason I got in 
And, um, and it was interesting because as soon as I moved to New York and as soon as I started actually playing around with making films, it was like this uh, lightning bolt struck me. And I realized that this was something that I liked doing, that I could do. And um, yeah, and it just felt natural. I didn't, it wasn't calculated, oh, I'm gonna be a director. It just felt right to be making these short films. And really it, it came out of my NYU short films. The short films kept getting a little longer and longer and I, I was winning some awards for them. And, uh, you know, that's really how Smithereens came about. It was really an extension of, you know, I made it, I started it the year I got out of uh, film school or the year after I got out. Um, and uh, with all my friends from NYU. So even then I wasn't calculating, oh, I'm gonna make my first feature film. It just, my films were getting longer and I was still working with the same people. Okay, so maybe we'll just start talking about Smithereens. Um, so how did you get the money to make this movie? How did you take it from an idea to like actually, to actually a finished product, but then also from a finished product to the Cannes Film Festival? Like how did Smithereens happen? Yeah, I never had all the money at, at one time. I'll tell you what, uh, just um, a, a funny anecdote about it was that uh, uh, around that time, my grandmother passed away and she had left me $15,000 for my wedding. And at that time, I was, I had a, a boyfriend that I was, uh, a serious boyfriend, and we were going to get married and... I didn't know I was gonna be making smithereens at that point, but um, to make a long story short, we broke up and I decided to take that wedding money and put it into a movie, which was the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> and um, so that was the, the initial seed money. Um, and uh, what I started off with was, I, you know, I got some friends and family to give me, an, I raised another five thousand dollars, so I had twenty thousand dollars to to start out, and I didn't know how much it was going to cost or how I would ever finish it. Um, but uh, I just kept shooting it, and I figured, you know, if it's, I hope that if it was good, to some extent, um, the money would come together. And it, weirdly enough, even when I finished shooting it, I didn't really have the money to take to pay the lab bill, which is the most expensive part of making an independent low budget film. No one was getting paid back then. Uh, and even that just ended up being a kind of lucky event. Uh, I'll, I'll backtrack a little. So I made the film, I shot it over a two year period. Okay. Um, I, I'm a great believer in uh, turning um, negative things, trying to use the negative and turn it into a positive. Uh, two weeks into filming, um, the lead actress, Susan Berman, who plays the character of Ren, during rehearsal, uh, broke her leg. And um, I thought, that's the end. You know, she, she was going to be in a cast for maybe four or five months. No one was getting paid. I thought I'd never be able to hold this group of the crew together because, uh, you know, again, because they weren't getting paid and they'd go off and find other real jobs. Um, but what I decided to do was edit the film, the two weeks of footage that we had shot, I just edited it in my apartment um, and see what was working and what wasn't. And one of the things that wasn't working at, in that early version was the male leading character of Eric, the, the character, the rock star character. Right. He wasn't played by Richard Hell in the first two weeks of filming. It was another act, another actor, and he wasn't a rock star. He was a kind of uh, slightly pretentious artist, painter. And um, when I looked at that, I said, mm, it's not working. This character of Ren would not be that interested in this, the, the way we were, we were then playing Eric. So I decided at that point to recast and rewrite um, and brought in a, a, a writing partner um, named Ron Nicewaner, who then went on to write some amazing 
movies like Philadelphia with Tom Hanks. And I think he's, he's, he's written a lot of great stuff. So um, did you know Richard Hell? Was he a friend of yours? I, knew, you... him. I, I yeah. knew that world and I was on the fringes of that world and fascinated by that world. And so uh, I thought even though the first Eric was an actor, a professional actor, I thought maybe it would be better to get somebody a little, once we change the direction, get somebody a little bit more authentic. And I didn't care whether they could, it wasn't about acting, it was about being. <laughs> Which a little bit relates to Desperately Seeking Susan as well. If you could get somebody who is that, you know, has whatever that quality is, whatever that interesting persona is. And, and if I could capture that on film, um, that was the challenge. And so that's what we did. So we then finished, shooting the movie and I edited it. And I, again, without any, you know, I didn't know anything about agents or film festivals. However, I had heard of the Cannes Film Festival. I mean, that was the only festival I had ever heard of back then. So this is obviously pre-internet and, uh -huh. you know, um, I sent a postcard uh, um, uh, applying, somehow I got an address of for the application, how to apply and I, I, I sent this postcard and then just didn't really remember, you know, I kind of put it in the back of my head, finished the movie. And the week that we got the first uh, uh, answer print was ready in the lab and I did not have the, the money to get it out of the lab. I did get a phone call from somebody saying, from the Cannes Film Festival saying, we're here in New York, if you can, bring your film to this address in the Times Square area, we'll, we'll take a look at it. So I, I spoke to the very nice guy who ran Do Our Film Lab, who was a friend to independent filmmakers. Um, and he said he would let me take the film out of the lab to bring it to the screening, uh, screening room, which I did. And then I got a call about two days later saying that we would like to put it in the uh, originally in the director's for fortnight, I said, wow, that's amazing. I then uh, got a call back uh, two days after that from the head of the entire film festival at that time, a guy named Gilles Jacob, who said, would you mind, I just saw it, can I take it out of the director's fortnight, which is a kind of uh, subcategory of the, 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 the big festival, and can I put it in the official competition? which I kind of was, you know, in shock, obviously agreed to that. And he said, but you're going to need a publicist, you're going to need trailers, you're going to need posters, you're going to need a lot of things which I didn't have the money to um, do. But uh, he said, can you meet with somebody from the festival at, for breakfast? Uh, at, and he gave me an address. Um, I met that person and he started talking to me about how he, you know, the film is going to go into the official selection, but I would need about another 15 to 25, depending, you know, I'd need a chunk of money to fulfill all the requirements. And sitting at the table right next to me at that restaurant was, happened to be a sales agent, two sales, two sales agents, uh, who overheard the conversation. Although now I wonder if they were planted. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I thought about that recently, but they happened to be sitting at the next table and said, you know what, if you let us represent your film as sales agents, uh, we will front you the money to get it out of the lab and to pay for all these things you'll need. So there's a line in the film that most of the rock and roll industry is funded by dentists. Um, so in, in this case, it, it was sales agents who were, who were looking, who kind of it, made things happen. Like and mother and sales agents. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. great. Uh, can you tell me about um, the lead actress? Tell me about Ren. I mean, you did, was she Susan Berman? Was she a friend of yours? Um, did, was this some? Was there a casting process? I mean, she's such a character, um, and, and Ren is really so defined by talking. She's always. She's always talking. She's always kind of telling small stories. She has this kind of powerful force of will in order to get her to kind of create a new version of herself. 
and she's always moving. The fact yeah. that she's constantly walking and um, is, is a big part of the story. But uh, Susan Berman, the actress who's wonderful, um, we, we had we had started doing auditions the traditional way. And back then, if you were an indie filmmaker, you'd put an ad in, in backstage newspaper, it was an actor's newspaper, and you'd say it was for a, you know, you'd write the description of the character and you got a lot of headshots and things like that. And I was meeting a bunch of people that way, but they all felt, uh, for lack of a better word, actory to me. Like they were acting this character and not, they didn't, there was something about the essence of the character that, that, that just didn't feel authentic enough. And uh, a friend of mine from film school um, happened to go to this, uh, it was like an off, 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 off Broadway performance where there were, you know, 15 people on stage and three people in the audience, but he spotted this actress who, you know, was in this, performance piece and he told me about her and said I think you know she's kind of interesting I think you should meet her and um uh I did and as soon as I met her there was just something so unique about her and so uh, feisty about her that um uh, that we clicked I think one of the things that's really distinctive about that movie is that Ren is very complicated and she's not always likable um, and, and I think that leads me to kind of to two questions. You know, one, is that something that you think we would remark upon if Ren was a man and this was a movie made by a man, you know, but also, you know, is there something distinct and challenging about putting a difficult woman at the center of a film? Well, I like difficult women. And even as a, you know, um, you know, when I started, even as a kid in some ways, I always liked those sort of bad girls. I found them much more interesting than the good girls in old movies. I was always a you know, fan of those, um, you know, in the 1940s, the, the, the tough broads and the, and the, you know, whether it's Carol Lumber, you know, the Lady Eve, you know, the, the, just the people that had a more complicated and colorful life. Um, so, uh, to me, it wasn't so much about, um, making her likable because the characters that I liked, the male characters that I liked so much when I started really getting serious about watching films, whether they were Jack Nicholson or even, uh, you know, Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate, they're not always good guys. They're, they're complicated and, and that's what makes them fun to watch and interesting, yet, the women were always, you know, bad, divided into one category, one category or the other, the bad girl or the good girl. Um, they, you know, there's that French movie, it was called The Mother and the Whore, and that was kind of the, the, the division. And so I wanted to make a, a film about a character who was not necessarily, the likability factor wasn't an issue. I wanted her to be interesting. I wanted her to be, to have both good and bad qualities. I love her tenacity. To me, that's a great quality. I love that she's a survivor. She's kind of like, uh, like the energizer bunny, you know, you can knock her over and she'll pop back up. I think that was a great uh, quality. Um, she is manipulative. She uses people, you know, I, that is not a positive quality, but uh you know, I, but, but to me, the, the, the fact that she was a survivor and the fact that she was so independent um, is what made her fascinating to me. I have a question, to, like building up on what you had said on, with the last answer and with this answer. So it's kind of like two questions. But my first question is you're talking about casting um, for Smithereens. I, I wanted to know, like, what was the deciding factor, like uniqueness um, that led you to cast, you know, your two leads and desperately seeking Susan? Because I know like the timing was really lucky because Madonna like wasn't famous quite yet when you cast her. And then, yeah, so, and, and Roseanne was an up and coming actor. So I was wondering like how you connected with them. And then also like just when you were talking about like characters and characters that you connect with, I was wondering, I know like directors often sometimes like will identify themselves with the character and in Desperately Seeking Susan, um, did you identify more with Roberta or Susan? 
Well, interestingly, going back to the casting, yeah. after, after working on Smithereens, where I was casting more for personality and authenticity than for uh, an acting resume or you know acting per se s skills, I felt comfortable working with, uh, let's say new actors or people who hadn't had a lot of acting experience if there was something about their persona that uh, that clicked for me. Um, you know, I, I've always lived in downtown New York and I kind of knew of Madonna. She wasn't a friend. She actually lived down the street from me at the time, but she, you know, I knew of her. I had maybe seen her around and, you know, but I definitely thought that there was something about her that um, was incredibly interesting. And that was a quality, instead of having her act Susan, it might be equally interesting, if not more so, to take Susan as she was written on the script page and, and kind of mold her more into Madonna. Again, Madonna was not famous at the time. Um, um, and I wasn't afraid of, of working that way because that's sort of how I had worked with Richard Hell in Smithereens. Um, Rosanna was an up and coming actress and to be totally honest, she was cast, she came on to the project. The producers had brought the project to her. Uh, I don't, maybe even before I was attached, they might've attached her. So um, I liked her and I, and I liked her work, but um, she was part of the package. Uh, Could you then mold the, that character to her strengths as you saw them, much like you did the Susan character? I think uh, um, for Ro Rosanna, what was great about Rosanna is she has a vulnerability about her that is absolutely charming. So that's something that was sort of heightened in the script. But she was act, you know, she's a, she's a good actress. She was acting. She's not a suburban housewife. Uh, she was kind of a you know, more of a actually, you know, in the rock and roll world, you know, I think she was dating somebody from Kansas, uh, whoever wrote the song, <laughs> Rosanna, whoever, whoever that was, she was dating them at the time. So she was far from a suburban housewife, but she was a great actress. And she had that wonderful, uh, just that, that dreamy quality that I thought was great for Roberta. But so, so back to your um, question about who I identified with more. Weirdly enough, why I like the project is because I was a split. I could have been the Roberta. I could have been a New Jersey housewife. I mean, uh, that very easily could have been my house and my husband and my life. But I had decided to move to New York and kind of, it's not totally reinvent myself, but just let my inner Susan come out. And so there was parts of me that related to the Madonna character. And again, why I like the, 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 the um, project so much is that it had these two women that I kind of equally related to. And also the Rosanna character is somebody who gets to reinvent herself. She doesn't do it intentionally. She gets bopped on the head and has amnesia. Um, but again, the other thing that I liked about the script when I first read it was that uh, I love screwball comedies. I loved, you know, Preston Sturgis. I loved all those women, uh, you know, to me, Scribble comedy allowed women to have great roles, way more interesting than than you know many of the serious dramas. They could have fun. They could, you know, really shine. And um, so, being able to use devices from scribble comedies like mistaken identity or like amnesia to me was, and, and but but to use it in a way to say something more soulful. It wasn't just a gimmick. I wanted to say something more um, true about, about reinvention, about recreating your life, uh, mm -hmm. but, but definitely using those devices to, to do so. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, about what Jewish American identity might might mean if it kind of surfaces in any ways 
in in Susan or or elsewhere in your work. I mean, I guess somehow in my mind the uh, um, you know that the housewife from New Jersey is Jewish or maybe Jewish or 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 at least is in a, a sort of world in which there are a lot of Jews and <laughs> and I somehow feel like Madonna isn't I'm pretty sure Madonna isn't and I somehow felt her character wasn't but maybe that's not well, true well, I guess Madonna you know may be Jewish now but <laughs> well the character wears four necklaces and three of them are crosses and one of them is a Jewish star yes yes well again being being Jewish and and um, you know, I think as, as a film director, one of the things, and, and I know that other directors that I respect who have, whose films have the director's personality in them, whether it's Martin Scorsese, who talks about the Italian American experience or Woody Allen when, you know, in the seventies and eighties, when he, you know, he very much brings his world and his life and his point of view into his films or Spike Lee for that matter. Um, um, I, I think you have to kind of do what you know or bring elements of what you know into your films. And I'm a, a, a Jewish American woman who came from a certain world. I know those characters. So for me, Roberta Glass was absolutely Jewish and her husband, the hot tub salesman, my father was a hardware salesman. It could have been, my father, my brother, my cousin, <laughs> um, and the characters at the party in the beginning, uh, you know, the dentist and the sister-in-law, you know, all those characters are characters that I know, the clothes they wear, the way they decorate their house, the, 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 their sense of humor, um, all came from a world I, I recognized and hope gentle fun at, because I think it's, funny but it's hopefully funny in a loving way you know i love those characters and that's what enables me to to kind of poke some fun at them like i would poke fun at myself um so yeah so there is that sensibility there um i you know smithereens is she jewish is she not susan berman happens to be half Jewish, <laughs> but, um, you know, she's again, the girl from New Jersey, not so much a middle-class New Jersey, more of a kind of working class New Jersey, but who's still crossing over that bridge to come to Manhattan, to have another world, to have an adventure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there is, a, but, but weirdly enough, people that don't know that the Gla that, that Roberta and Gary Glass are Jewish, to me, they absolutely are. Their name says it all, too. Don't know that. <laughs> I think so the thing that steals it for me is there's that scene where they're, where Mark Blum's character is pulling food out of the fridge and he's making himself like a, you know, a deli sandwich. Yeah. And Stephen Wright's character comes over and he's picking up the chicken. And you know the sister says like, "How could you eat at a time like this?" Uh, but it, it, that seems so very Jewish to be, be kind of meticulously putting together this deli sandwich uh, while all of this is going on. Um, yeah. Yeah. But on that note of casting, you, you also you set the stage at that party. You have Stephen Wright, you have Carol Leifer, you have these Jewish comedians who are also inhabiting that space. Uh, were, were you really connected to the comic world that was going out, or what was it about these people? Uh, that you brought into the film? Well, they were funny. And, and I wanted that world to be, you know, charming and, 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 and funny and also specific. You know, around that time also, even Gary Glass's uh, TV commercial, you know, Gary's Oasis. You know, I grew up, you know, back in the early days of early cable TV, there were all these, you know, cra crazy eddies and these, uh, you know, uh, Jewish businessmen that were doing their own commercials. Um, so, you know, again, I'm, I know all those references and I don't know whether all audiences will get it, but, but I think Jewish audiences and even non-Jewish audiences do, do get that. Um, yeah, I mean, the casting in, in Desperately Seeking Susan was really interesting because it, it was a mix of, um, up and coming um, movie actors and stage actors, such as John Turturro. I think this was his first uh, movie role. 
um, people who went on like Giancarlo Esposito has a little character and he went on to do a lot of interesting stuff. So there were those kinds of actors. There were sort of East Village or downtown uh, uh, rock and musicians and performance artists like uh, John Laurie or um, well, Richard Hell makes a cameo in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Richard Edson, who had been in, you know, Jim Jarmusch's breakthrough movie, uh, Annie Golden, who had a band called, I think it was called The Shirts at the time. And so there are a lot of, if you know that world, you'll see the film is peppered with all these little cameos. And if you don't know that world, you can still enjoy their performances, even without knowing who they were. And then, of course, uh, Madonna, who... Uh, you know, when we started filming, I, I, there's a, a, an anecdote that when we started filming, I mean, actually when we did the first screen test because uh, the people at Orion Pictures had never heard of her before. Um, this was, uh, she had just come out with her first music uh, MTV video. This was very early MTV. And I think it was Holiday or um, I forget what her Oh, name. Lucky Star, I think might be the Lucky first one. Star. It was Lucky Star. And um, uh, they wanted us to do a screen test. So we went out into the park. Me, Ed Lockman, the cinematographer, an assistant, and Madonna just walked to, this was Union Square Park, to shoot a little screen test. And I remember uh, as we were doing it, there was a camera there, you know, obviously we were shooting it, but very low key. Somebody uh, in the crowd walked by and went, oh, there's Cindy Lauper. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, interestingly enough, the, the shoot, you know, there was a couple of weeks of, of, of rehearsals, let's say four, four weeks of rehearsal, then it was a nine week shoot. By the time we were in the last week of shooting, her album had come out and she was on the cover of Rolling Stone and we actually had to hire extra security wherever we went when we were shooting with her just to kind of keep crowds away. Um, her, her trajectory was like a rocket. So, and again, not expected, um, but you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I always think that success is sort of a combination of uh, timing and, and having the right thing at the right time. And you can't predict when that will happen. Yeah, I have, that was so wonderful. I have a question that kind of comes out of this this idea of you making that film at a moment when when sort of different media are sort of just like taking off, like the beginning of MTV and cable news with these hilarious, ridiculous ads. And and it made me feel like this is, you know, you're you're documenting a moment of all these media existing simultaneously, you know, this this new cable news and and then or cable TV, and then this, you know newspapers paper and just this huge role that that paper and the ads in papers and the circle the sort of paperness of the paper you know with the the ads circled in red you're like so you're, you're so like like lovingly you know giving time to the paper and and it makes me feel like could, could that is there something about that movie that has to do with that that moment when people are still in the old world of media and yet the new world is sort of almost visible like you couldn't make it now is is there a way that you also could sort of see the movie as like reflecting on media itself well I, it it is a, a time capsule of the time it was made um i mean it's interesting having watched it on a big screen i guess it was about three years ago was the last time i watched it I was actually surprised at um, how many kind of low tech uh, references there were to now high tech things. I mean, everything from selfies to, uh, you know, I mean, isn't Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, isn't that all a way of saying, who is this girl? Who, I, you know, um, I, I exist, here I am, do you want to get to know me? Um, in, in, instead of making Xerox copies of your face as, as, as Ren does, or taking uh, Polaroid selfies of yourself, which is the, the, the introduction of the uh, Susan character in the hotel room in Atlantic City, she's doing selfies. Um, so that, that surprised me how 
you know, just to see the, the inklings of that in, a, in the low tech way or placing ads in, you know, hooking up <laughs> using the personal column. Uh, in this case, it's two women who are hooking up, but, but you know, now it's sort of a, a commonplace thing. Um, so, so to me, you know, watching it again and seeing those things is really interesting. Also watching New York City and seeing how it evolved. I mean, even the slight difference between Smithereens and uh, Desperately Seeking Susan, there was like a two or three year interim period. Um, the Smithereens, which came out in 82, but was shot mostly in 1980, coming out of the bankruptcy crisis, in New York City, when the city was really at its dirtiest, unruliest, uh, grittiest, which was a great time to kind of capture that on film. Um, you know, seeing it as it gets a little bit more gentrified by the time we get to Desperately Seeking Susan. It's not quite as gritty. Also, Desperately Seeking Susan definitely is a fairy tale version, intentionally um, a fairy, a, a, you know, a, a glamorized version of the city. We wanted it to stay, you know, keep its grit, but the lighting is a little bit magical. The, you know, crossing the bridge, like going to the land of Oz or down the rabbit hole in, in Alice in Wonderland, you're going to a new world. You know, New York is, is definitely much more heightened and, and, and um, magical than the New York of Smithereens. Well, there's that shot when Madonna's character, when Susan gets off the bus, when she first comes in from New Jersey, yeah. the, the words yeah. you see are liberty. Uh, I mean, it's the liberty bus line, but liberty is kind of just out there in very, very yeah. big letters. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did, you know, when, oh, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. I was going to say, all, all the details are intentional. <laughs> well, that's what I love about your movies. As I was saying earlier, in, Smither in Smithereens, you have that great shot where you know, it's, it's hard, it, there's a structure of a love triangle, but I put love in quotation marks because it, it's not really clear what any of the characters are, you know, to, if there's any romance involved with any of these characters' relationships. Um, but you first see Ren and Eric, the, not Eric, the, um, uh, I'm blanking on the other, on Paul. You, you see them in this bathroom and there's an illuminated bud sign you know, kind of right behind them for, for Budweiser beer. So right. immediately you're cued in, like this is the friend relationship and it's never gonna become, you know, anything past that. Right, well, talking about details, I mean, one of the things, and maybe that's coming from a design background as well, is that I always believe you can say a lot by picking the right detail. And, you know, um, in the case of, I mean, some of my favorite details, the opening of Smithereens, when you see the woman with the black and white checkered sunglasses, and then you see a pair of legs enter the frame, and the the girl uh, who's wearing uh, is wearing a black and white checkered vinyl miniskirt, and you just know she's got to have those sunglasses. You don't have to have dialogue about it. You don't have to set it up. You don't have the backstory. You see the sunglasses. You see the vinyl miniskirt enter, and you know she's going to snatch them and take off running. Um, the same with uh, one of my favorite moments, and I give credit, 100% of the credit uh, to this, to, to Madonna, is in the bathroom at Port Authority when she gets off that bus and she goes into the bathroom and she opens her suitcase, which is kind of like a, a big, um, I don't know if it's a drum kit kind of case, painted with the skulls. And, uh, you know, which tells you she's already, she's a drifter, she's a traveler, and she gets washed and she uh, dries her underarms in the hair, in the hair blower. Right. Uh, that tells you so much about that character. You don't, more than dialogue could, could ever tell you. So but it's also the way that that, there's also the way that that exchange, you know, that, that plays out and how you shot that and how it was, was set. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the male gaze versus the female gaze and what it means to show women on film. But when Madonna does that in the movie, it's this kind of moment of, it feels like very powerful. And she's kind of very much taking ownership of everything and saying that I'm in charge of, of, my, of everything that I want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
So while we're on the topic of, you know, New York, um, how did you find the locations for this movie? Were these places that you would, would go to? I mean, for actually, I guess for either Smithereens or for Desperately Seeking Susan. Um, but if the, it feels like, Smithereens feels like you maybe found, you know, the most gritty. You know, you have these empty lots. You have, it's the city at its emptiest and, and the, the Lower East Side at its emptiness. Whereas Desperately Seeking Susan, you capture that excitement and everything has its own color palette. So you have the pink of New Jersey and then you have the, the like, green aura of the magic club, but in between you have all of these other colors coming in. And then right. you have this magical dance scene where in the nightclub where Gary Glass is comes to meet Susan and Madonna is playing and you're hearing into the groove. Uh, and it all just feels very transfixing, but so rooted in its in in where it's shot. Yeah. Well well in Smithereens it was it, the production design was not about, we didn't have any money to really art direct things that much. It was, it was all about location scouting, driving around the city. Some of the areas, I, I lived in the East Village, so some of the areas I knew. And, and there's, I, I love texture. I mean, some of my favorite kinds of films are the early Italian neorealism films of the of, of Fellini's early films like uh, La Strada, Knights of Cabiria, where you feel the rubble, you feel the, you know, it's post-World War II and you feel the grit. Well, this was, po this was you know, post-bankruptcy uh, um, New York. They're, they're, you know, everything was falling apart, but there's a beauty in that. So that was what we were looking for, selecting the right locations that had that quality. Um, with Desperately Seeking Susan, it was much more created. We knew some of the locations we wanted, but because we were adding this fairy tale magical element, which was something that evolved in conversation with um, Ed Lockman, the DP, and Santo Loquasto, who um, was the production designer and this, uh, the costume designer, um, was to try to kind of take the grit, but but uh, add light to it or add um, that magical quality. For example, we used a lot of colored lights in exterior locations like outside of the Magic Club just to kick it up a notch. And if you look at the Magic Club itself, you can't kind of pinpoint what time period it is. It's a little bit like, like a Atlantic City bar from the 1950s. It's a little bit like a punk club. It's, it's a mix of modern and old fashioned and, you know, seedy and punky. And so all these time elements that are interesting, but merged, you know, pulled together. Uh, interestingly enough about that location, we, we did film it at a, 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 a a, a ballroom that had been falling apart for many years. It was called the Audubon Ballroom that was in Harlem that happened to be where Malcolm X was shot and killed. Wow. Um, and then they, after that, they, you know, this, this ballroom, they just let to go to rack and ruin. And uh, so it had all that texture there. And then Santo uh, sort of brought in the art direction just to kind of, you know, well, one of the things that I, I like what you just said about the Magic Club, because all of the characters seem to have different responses to it. You know, they're the characters who think this is a dump, and then they're the characters who are really engaged in what's happening there. And yeah. Stephen Wright's character, when he comes and he's very earnestly critiquing um, the performance and saying, hey, that's a great trick. Uh, and he's like very pleased with, you know, how Roberta, how Roberta is doing there. Right. Um, so I want to take this moment to say that we're going to start having audience questions. So if people want to add questions into the into the chat, into the Q&A, we'll, um, we'll, you could either ask them yourself directly or like raising your hand, I think we have that function, or um, we, can, we can ask the questions on your behalf. Um, and I know also that Paloma has a number of questions that she wanted to, to ask. Uh, so while the audience is gathering some, uh, Paloma. Thanks, Aton. Um, I wanted to ask, um, what's it like being a female director working in the industry and looking back like do you wish do you, like what piece or pieces of advice do you wish you could give yourself as a young woman entering the industry and like i'm also particularly particularly interested in that because i'm studying theater uh, and i've been acting my whole life and also really interested in producing um so 
yeah, I'd love to hear about your experience. Well, back in, in those days, um, there weren't that many female directors. I mean, um, I when I was in film school, this was, you know, mid to late 70s, the only woman who was directing movies that I knew of was Elaine May. And then there were some European women, um, Agnes Varda and uh, Lena Wertmuller, uh, who were doing it. But, but it, it, you know, so I didn't really think of myself in the context of, I, to be honest, I never said, oh, it's going to be so impossible for me to make movies because there aren't any <laughs> women making movies. I was totally naive and I am so glad I was so naive because there, there was no internet. I wasn't reading Variety and Hollywood Reporter. I did not know how bad it was. I didn't know how bad the statistics were. So I just went about, oh, I'll, I'll make a movie. It was a little bit like, you know, uh, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, oh, let's put on a show in the, in the barn. Um, and then it just so happened to, that movie happened to be successful for me, but it was total naivete on my part, thankfully, and just the ability to want to tell a story. So, you know, my advice is always to people, young people who are starting out is don't think about yourself as a statistic. Just if you have something to say, just find a way of saying it, whether you have, you know, $10,000 or $2 million or $50 million. Just think about what the story is you want to tell. Um, yeah. Uh, again, a lot of the things I did, even, you know, from applying to the Cannes Film Festival, it was just a sense of why not? <laughs> um, I'm going to try fully answered your. Yeah, no, totally. That is a great answer. Uh, yeah, there, there was something that I did want to add while we're waiting to yeah. an earlier discussion. And I, I, you sent me some questions and Eitan sent me some questions. And it was about New York City. And we started to talk about the difference between New York City in 1980 and then 1984, five, when Desperately Seeking Susan came out. And then I had the opportunity to do the, to, to work on Sex in the City. I had done the pilot episode. And comparing the New York of those three time periods is, is sort of interesting because the New York of the late 90s when Sex in the City came out, it was, a, it was still a, a kind of authentic, semi-authentic version of New York, but New York had changed so significantly um, and the New York lifestyle and New York characters had changed so significantly over that, that period of time. If I look at Ren and uh, the character of Ren and the character of Susan and, and Roberta, they were not careerists. They were adventurers. They wanted to have an adventure. They were kind of uh, gypsy-like, you know, wanderers. Um, their boyfriends, or the, the, the male, the leading men in that, uh, those films were, you know, one was kind of a, a manipulative rock star, not not a very successful one, but but you know, clearly had rock and roll aspirations, is willing and was willing to use anyone who could, he could to get where he wanted to go. But his aspirations were still rock and roll. Uh, Des, um, the uh, Roberta's, the, the leading man, Aidan Quinn, and desperately seeking Susan was an art cinema projectionist <laughs> he liked art movies he he was a you know he he had no great career aspirations and then i look at the leading man in interestingly enough in, in sex in the city and he's a venture capitalist <laughs> and and the women are very clearly very um career oriented driven uh success oriented you know you look at again looking at it from a costume point of view Ren and Madonna's clothes were what they could find you know what they could put together in an interesting way from a secondhand store or a flea market they weren't four hundred dollar Manolo Blahniks you know <laughs> they were you know so that to me looking at the New York 
as, as you know, in a time capsule in those three time periods is a kind of interesting, it's interesting to compare how the city had changed. So we have a question from the audience about Sex and the City, um, which I'll read. Um, Susan, what was it like to work on the pilot of Sex and the City? Did it feel like something entirely new and important? Or what did you think of the idea for the show at the time? Well, I have to be honest, they sent me the script and I said, yeah, I read the script and I said, yes, count me in. And the reason I said, yes, count me in was because I thought it was so, I thought it was bold. Uh, and I loved, um, you know, I've made a lot of films about the relationships between female characters. And that was to me what, what I liked the most about it is I liked the friendship. To me, it's a female friendship story. That's the best part of it. Not, I mean, there's the sex part, but the friendship part is to me what makes it unique. And that the, fa the fact that the women were so open and, you know, it was kind of the way women, you know, probably more clever <laughs> than a lot of the, <laughs> the lines I might say to my friends, but because <laughs> they were written by very clever writers, but they had a boldness uh, in the way that, that women do talk amongst themselves or um, that I thought was, uh, was very unique and hadn't been done before. And, and I love that it was in New York, a different New York than what I had captured earlier, but mm -hmm. still the city is very much a part of of that show. Did you know any of the actresses uh, going in? I I did. I mean, I knew Cynthia Nixon because I had actually met her in various, uh, actually auditions. She was a New York, predominantly a stage actress uh, who had done some indie films. And I knew weirdly enough, um, Mr. Big. Mr. Big has a small role. He's in, in Smithereens. He's a, um, a a uh, transvestite in the back of the van in the last scene uh, in, <laughs> in Smithereens. So I knew Chris Noth from those days. Uh, I knew who the other actresses were, but um, uh, I, yeah. But, but the, the two people that I was more involved in the casting of because they were New Yorkers was Cynthia Nixon and Chris Noth. What was that transition like from directing features to to then the television episodes? You know, it was it, it, it wasn't that difficult because, again, I really did like the script and I liked the New York ishness of it. I think I might have, you know, I, directing the pilot, you get to kind of create the template that tells you, uh, defines what the show might look like or will look like to some extent in the future. It, it evolves, but so I was involved in that process. I have directed other TV um, episodic stuff and I have to be very honest, I do not enjoy that. Uh, coming in as a director to do an episode when the show has already been established, you know, like, um, I don't even remember the shows I've done, but like, it wasn't Law and Order, but like Law and Order, there's a template, and you know the director's there just to make sure the actors know where to stand, and you know you get all the shots you need. But you're not involved in sort of creating the bones. <laughs> uh, with Desperate, uh, sorry, with um, Sex in the City, doing the pilot, there was nothing there before I did the pilot, so that that was really satisfying. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's true about that show and also true about a lot of her work is that you, you, you work with these actresses who are kind of larger than life and are really, you know, very powerful people. I'm thinking in this case, you know, all of them are so well-defined on Sex and the City, but Sarah Jessica Parker's character really is, is so mm -hmm. dominant. Um, but maybe while we're waiting for more questions from the audience, I'll ask, uh, what was it like to work with Meryl Streep in, um, in She Devil and also Roseanne? And, yeah. Just some of these, and then also behind the scenes, what was it like to work with Nora Ephron on, on Cookie? Um, just these really dynamic uh, actresses and filmmakers. Yeah, um, I, I like working with strong women because, uh, you know, if they're good, they make me look good. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's definitely an advantage. Um, Meryl and, I, I really enjoyed working with both Meryl and Roseanne on She Devil, they were so opposite, but 
to me, there, there was also that weird uh, dynamic, similar in some ways to Desperately Seeking Susan, where you take two very different characters and you watch how their lives impact on one another. And, um, you know, She Devil was a revenge comedy, so their lives are impacting in vengeful ways. In Desperately Seeking Susan, it was more empowering ways. But, um, but there, there was something interesting about two opposites and just seeing how they can, what they have in common, because at the end of She-Devil in the film, Meryl has changed and evolved and so has Roseanne has gone from being powerless to power, powerful. Um, they have both very different styles of acting. I mean, with Meryl Streep, I, I'm not gonna tell her out how to act. I mean, <laughs> you know, you have to kind of know who you're working with and how to, you know, my job was to kind of keep the story on track and try to, you know, because you're shooting a film out of order. So, you know, it's the director's job to kind of keep, to know how all these puzzle pieces are going to fit into the story when you get into the editing room and you have to put them together. So you might, you know, give notes about, you know, maybe, you know, to, 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 to the character would be a little angrier, would be, you know, um, a little more upset or, you know, when her mother comes to visit or what, whatever those kinds of very specific notes are, uh, you know, are, 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 it's the way I would interact with Meryl because she is so smart and she knows exactly what she's doing and how to do it. Whereas with Roseanne, she had never been in a movie before. So it was really more about trying to coax and figure out how to get a, a, a performance out of her. But also she had that, you know, that, that kind of ordinary housewife quality. She had made her career based on that um, I don't know what she was called, an American goddess or what is she, she had a nickname for herself. And that was the quality that I wanted to bring out because it was so opposite in real life and on screen to Meryl Streep's um, Mary Fisher character. So playing again with the reality of who these people were and imbuing that into the characters on film. So one thing, since while, while we're waiting, I'll, I'll ask uh, another question. Um, you know, one of the things that is notable in Smithereens is that it makes everything feel extremely exciting that's going on in New York. You kind of depict the city in such a way that even though it seems down and out, there's this energy and there's this nerve, but also everyone is trying to move to Los Angeles. Uh, the, everyone, they're trying to get the money, they're trying to hustle so that they could get out and get to Los Angeles. So. Was this kind of autobiographical worry? Did you feel as if the city was kind of not going to have this creative potential that you wanted? You know, were you worried that you were going to have to move to LA in order to take your next steps as a filmmaker? No, I didn't. I mean, to me, LA was sort of the candy colored version of fame and fortune. Uh, New York, uh, you can still be rich and famous and creative and all these other things, but it's in a lower key manner, you know, what, 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 which is why I've always stayed in New York and, and to some extent mo not moved to LA, despite the fact that I also couldn't drive and um, <laughs> like street culture. So LA wasn't the right place for me, but um, New York, um, LA is the fantasy version of all those things. And so that's why Ren and Eric, who are kind of down and out, you know, aspiring, or he's an aspiring rock star, maybe a little famous in his punk world, is, is, is looking at this uh, rainbow. Um, but for me, it, it, it wasn't a rainbow. And uh, I, I, I know my place. I like New York. I like I like, uh, you know, traveling by subway and overhearing conversations. I like 
seeing stuff when I walk around the streets and taking notes. Um, you know, that, that's where I get my inspiration. We actually have a New York related question in the Q&A chat, so I'll read it. Um, I was curious to know more about the real East Village, New York City location, locations you shot in Desperately Seeking Susan, like Love Saves the Day. Were people excited about these spaces being included in a film in terms of creating an East Village underground scene? Oh, I think so. I mean, again, authenticity was really important. Um, so filming, you know, when you see Rosanna and Madonna, uh, uh, sorry, Roberta following Susan down St. Mark's Street, where she knocks into the guy selling sunglasses and all that. That was St. Mark's at that time was sort of the main, was the Fifth Avenue, if you will, of, of downtown, uh, you know, East Village life uh, love saves the day was also one of those stories so trying to you know just keep it real um was really important because again we didn't even we didn't want to art direct that nor could did we have that much money to be able to do so so selecting the right locations was really important I have a question. Um, what What do you think is has been like the most challenging part of being a director? Um, you know, I think the challenging part is staying fresh. Is that, and I see this, um, you know, as something, you know not just with directors, but I think with all creative people, one, if you get rewarded for doing something, people tend to want you to keep doing that thing. And also you can suddenly find yourself in a slightly protective bubble um, where you're not getting the kind of honest feedback. Uh, you know, I see that with stars, some actors or musicians with their performances what made them great was that they were in touch with their audiences they were in touch with reality and real life and then suddenly you have a lot of agents and managers and people that are filtering information and so you the thing that inspired you in the beginning you're you're now sealed off from um i think that can happen to directors too you get pigeonholed to some extent so, so thinking about um, you know what you were just saying about agents and managers, you know that's that's a very different world than making your first movie with the fifteen thousand dollars that you did not use yeah. for your wedding. Um, yeah. So what what was it like moving into the studio system and trying to be creative in that atmosphere? Yeah, it was actually I was very nervous because Smithereens was uh, I. It was a surprise success. I never thought it was gonna get a theatrical release. I never thought it would be at the Cannes Film Festival. And suddenly after that experience, I did find myself with an agent who I liked um, and, and suddenly scripts were being set my way. But I also knew that there were not very many female directors at that point. And I knew, as certainly not making studio movies. And I knew that I, I had to be really smart about the next thing I picked. So for about two years after Smithereens, I was reading scripts that were submitted from studios, but they were a lot of um, high school comedies. Uh, not I, I, There's some great high school comedies. I think, you know, a, um, Best Times at Ridgemont High is a, is, a, is a very smart and good one. But the ones I were getting, uh, that I was receiving were, were not smart. <laughs> and, um, and I didn't want to do them. Um, I, I also felt that it was not just important to find the right project, but also to find the right team to work with. And again, because I had heard some stories about specifically another female filmmaker who had made a independent film that was successful, then made her first studio movie and um, had a hard time working with a very powerful producer. And, you know, I've never had 
I've never felt comfortable with people looking over my shoulders. I work best when people let me do the thing I can do and I'm not self-conscious about doing it. And I just work in my own funky way. So the team was really important to me. So I was reading stuff, not responding to it until I happened to get uh, two years later, uh, the script Desperately Seeking Susan, which A, had my name in it. <laughs> and I'm superstitious, so that was a, a factor. It was also partially set in, in the East Village, a world that I knew, and the other half was set in, in suburbia, another world I knew. So that was, you know, manna from heaven. <laughs> Um, and then I uh, met the producers and they were two women who had never made a movie before and were very nice. I liked that they were women. I liked that the screenwriter, um, Leora Barish was a woman, but I also felt like I wasn't gonna get intimidated or bullied by having a, you know, an experienced guy producer, you know, chomping on a cigar, looking over my shoulder telling me what to do because that's the way he does things. Uh, in, in fact, in terms of the production team for Desperately Seeing Susan, I was the most experienced. I had made a movie before. No one else, <laughs> you know, behind the camera had. So um, that gave me the confidence and they had confidence in me that I could bring my world to the, to the movie. Um, so all those piece, uh, pieces fell into place. Uh, and they also let me pick the DP that I wanted to work with, Ed Lockman and, um, you know, uh, so it wasn't that different. The, the, uh, the thing that was really different was suddenly working with a union crew. Um, and I'm sure when I showed up on set, first of all, at that time I was, I don't know, maybe 30, one, 30, 31, I, I, you know, pretty young. Um, I'm only five feet tall, so I was not an imposing uh, figure. You know, I looked like I was one of the um, um, PAs, uh, you know, or a golfer, really. Um, in fact, I remember, you know, one of the electricians or grips asking me to get him a cup of coffee, you know, one day when I showed up, you know, maybe the first day or second day, whatever. And uh, I thought that that was kind of funny and I don't get insulted easily. So I got him a cup of coffee, gave him and told him I was the director. But um, that was the, the, the most unusual part was just sort of working with a union crew and suddenly there were trucks and campers and, you know, 50 people where on, on Smithereens there had been, you know, eight. Was, was this the only time or one of the rare times that you worked on a studio film that you felt that you did get to have that control? Um, is, that, is that part of the novelty about this movie or um, you felt that you did continue to get the creative opportunities within the studio system? I, I figured for the most part, I, you know, it's, it's weird. I, I got to have creative control and set the, the movie I did after, um, Desperately Seeking Susan was called Making Mr. Right. And again, they did give me creative control. If I have to be honest, um, that was a really fun movie to make it was with John Malkovich and Ann Magnuson, who was the cigarette girl in Desperately Seeking Susan, now the star of Making Mr. Right. You know, one of the things that happened, if, if I can be critical of my own work, I would say after Desperately Seeking Susan, was an unexpected success critically and at the box office. The studio said she can make whatever she wants. And um, I was playing around with a bunch of prop projects at the time, but the one script that uh, uh, was at the head of the line was, was making Mr. Right. And I think uh, and the studio it was Orion Pictures. They didn't question it. Like I didn't go through a big screening process. With Desperately Seeking Susan, there were lots of rewrites and there were lots of people questioning the story, the um, 
just making sure every, you know, I, when people question you, you have to come up with answers and that's a good part of the process because you figure stuff out when, when people are questioning you. No one was questioning me with making Mr. Right. It was sort of like a first draft and they said, go do it, get, you know, here's the money, go shoot it. Um, and I loved many things about it, but I think that film would have benefited if I had had a little bit, bit more time to maybe refine certain things, refine the script, think, think some more things through. Um, and if I had had more people questioning what I was doing, which is, as I said, I think is a good thing for any creative person, you know? So that happened too fast. Uh, I enjoyed making it and there's many things about it I like. I loved working with Anne Magnuson and John Malkovich and I loved the theme. Uh, it was sort of a, you know, a woman falls in love with an android because she can't find a human man that uh, uh, she's compatible with. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and I liked the kind of funky, uh, it, it has a a kind of retro futuristic, it was kind of inspired by the Jetsons, <laughs> the cartoon, the Jetsons, it's a retro version of the future. At that time, there were a lot of, you know, uh, high tech futuristic movies being made. So I wanted to kind of pull, push in the other direction, which was fun. But I think uh, I made it too quickly. And I, um, yeah, I would have made it slightly differently if I, had more time to think certain things through. I think we're getting toward the end of our time, but I see two more uh, questions that have come in from audience members. And I think they're both kind of short, so maybe they'll be our last questions. Okay, uh, okay. One is uh, an audience member who says, we rewatched Desperately Seeking Susan last night and really enjoyed it. As you said, it's a time capsule. Do you have any idea how current audiences receive it? So that's question number one. I can say we watched it. I watched it with my family and my 19 year old and she loved it. She was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Uh, but that's, like, that's part of current audiences. But anyway, um, and then the other- one, then before, then then more um, yeah, I watched it uh, about three years ago on a big screen. There was a cinema called the Metrograph that had a new cinema that just opened in the, in the Lower East Side. And the audience was pre predominantly millennials. They were people who had never, lived through the 80s and and I was pleasantly surprised by the response. Uh, maybe they were looking at it in a kind of nostalgic retro way thinking, oh, wasn't New York cool back then? I don't know if that was it. But I also think that the theme of being able to, wanting to reinvent yourself, uh, wanting to have a more interesting life, are universal and timeless themes. So I think underneath the clothing and the music and all that, um, I think that they related to the, the core idea there. That's wonderful. And then the last, which totally relates to my 19 year old. Um, and then the last question that just came up is how did, very practical, tachlis. So we're ending with a kind of Jewish note. How did you make <laughs> it meet between films during the early stage of your career as a director? <laughs> so well, that's I, what we're say that again. I didn't. How, how did you make ends meet? between films during the early stage of your career as a director? Yeah, well, once Smithereens hit, I was able to make film, uh, uh, I was able to pay bills because I was getting money from Smithereens and I was also um, getting money to develop projects. But in between film school and Smithereens, I had uh, part-time jobs as a temp back when you actually had to type. Uh, I was not good at it. So most of the jobs were temporary because uh, they were. And fortunately, back then, I also got some money from grants. That was back when when New York, when the, the there was an, an endowment for the humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the AFI was giving grant money. And so was the New York Foundation for the Arts. So I was able to get uh, apply for a couple different grants and get money. Um, I, I applied with them with the short films I had made when I was an NYU film student. 
and was able to get some money um, to survive and finish working on the short films I was making at the time. Wonderful. Okay, Shana. Hello, thank you so much, Susan. This was, you have so many amazing stories and <laughs> insights to offer us. And I, I, I know everybody here has, would just would keep listening to you tell your stories uh, and offer your insights. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks again to Eitan, Gabriella, and Paloma uh, for your contributions to this discussion and for everybody who attended today. Um, thanks everybody and have a wonderful afternoon and stay safe. Thank you for inviting me and thank you guys for the great questions. I really appreciated it. It was fun. Thank, thank you. you so it was great. much. This thank is amazing. You.